Alright, and we should be live now. Uh, yeah, so... So, let's talk about the single card pass or the one card pass. I like calling it, calling it the single card pass because it sounds fancier than the one card pass. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, it, it doesn't really matter, but... Uh, sorry, let me just adjust the mic first. All right. So, uh, right, the one card pass, it's basically... Uh, it's going to be the last sort of past I'm going to touch on uh, before like next month I'm going to go back to revisit the classic pass because I sort of botched the live stream for the classic pass uh, it was kind of bad so you know uh, the, the sound quality for that was just sort of horrible so you know uh, this this is going to be the last pass I'm going to touch on and so yeah I'm not going to touch on the Leipzig pass or the bluff pass it's not really my sort of like move to do so I didn't really do any work on it but yeah so the one card pass now so uh generally uh I won't really do a pro or cons list for this uh for this particular one because the one card pass is more or less an umbrella term so uh right so it's like an umbrella term for just displacing a single card to your desired position more or less it's not really it doesn't really describe a mechanic so I can't really give like a pro or cons list comparing it to different passes because it's sort of uh it's too vague for it to sort of be compared but you know it's uh yeah so it's it's something but um yeah so the one that i'm gonna be teaching is sort of bad i'm just gonna say it right from the start it is sort of bad as a move and i'll get into that later but uh so yeah if you do want to learn like more or less a single card like control or sort of thing i would just tell you to do like a call or just like a straddle pass if you really want to do a one card pass or just like openly like take the card out and just cut it to the face i think that's way like more effective than this move but uh it's just more move monkey stuff so i do think it is uh more uh more knowledge so it's just it's it's yeah it's just more knowledge it's yeah it's more knowledge is better so it's whatever but yeah so it's definitely a product of its era but you know i do think it is uh a def uh, definitely an interesting thing to learn so that's why i'm uh, teaching it but yeah so uh let's get into some brief history as to uh the move and uh well just one card passes and then i'll go into the history of this specific one card pass so the very first one card pass that I know of, at least, uh, yeah, comes from a German book. I'm not going to read out the German title because, frankly, I can't read German. It comes from a German title called uh, The Modern Card Artist, and it was written by Frederick uh, W. Uh, what was it? Conradi, I think. And it was first published in 19, uh, 1896. So it is a very, uh, very old move. But uh, yeah, it was basically called, uh, the translation is called with, withdrawing a card. So that is basically what a single uh, card pass is. Um, you can get the book uh, from library. So L-Y-B-R-A-R-Y, -R -R -Y, so library. But um, yeah, that's not the one that I'm going to be teaching. The one that I'm going to be teaching is from Erdnays. So S.W. Erdnays. Uh, the Expert at the Card Table, 1902. Uh, it, I'm referring it to. Uh, I'm referring to it as a one card pass because the official title for this move is called Ordinary Methods of Stocking, Locating, and Securing. So it is a very long title. So I'm just gonna call it a one card pass because uh, that's shorter and that is technically what it is. So one card pass. Um, yeah, so let me just get into uh, a, a disclaimer first before uh, I do anything. So uh, I do want to uh, say that, you know, don't do this <laughs> move in uh, for gambling stuff or whatever. Uh, Concern the history behind it, you know, it's, co it's from expert at the card table. So naturally, it's a gambling move, but don't do it in games. Uh, this is for entertain entertainment purposes only. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess, uh, and you might be wondering why I'm saying this. It's because I remember, like, uh, Jeremy Griffith, he taught, like, a mucking move, a, a muck, at, uh, 50, at, like, the 52 cards, uh, channel. And a kid was like, yeah, I'm gonna use this move, but get so much money. I'm like, don't do that! <laughs> but, yeah, so, 
don't do that uh, because you're gonna get yourself beat up. And also, again, this is a product of its era. This is from 1902. This was from like 121 years ago. So why would you try to do that after a century has passed? It's it's a it's a move that doesn't really fit our current time, uh, anyways. So nowadays, uh, for casino games, especially for gambling games. Um, a lot of move uh, a lot everything is regulated so unlike the time where everything was privated so everything was like a private game and everyone was uh, really like slacking off or whatever right everyone did their own thing uh casino games are like observed so observed so if you get like spotted cheating well you're probably gonna get kicked out and banned for life and if you do try to do this at like illegal private games you're probably gonna get shot or something right because private games are already illegal and so you know one dead body is already like whatever right so you know don't do this for anything uh gambling related just do this for entertainment purposes only but yeah um uh it's not even a good move anyways for this era so you know it's uh i i don't see why anyone would do this anyways but yeah so without further ado let's get into the original method of the uh, of the urinase move of the one card uh, past I'm not gonna print the say the full name of so yeah so uh, the entire move revolves around the fact that you're trying to basically fidget around with the deck that's basically what the move is supposed to look like and what's supposed to feel like again I do much prefer the um, the call over this move in case that you're you know doing a fidget move so doing a move while you're playing around with the deck but you know it's uh, another alternative but it is meant to be done before you're shuffling it so you're meant to like stack all the cards and then you're doing your shuffle work uh to you know do whatever the move uh, to you know keep the card on top or whatever and then, uh, yeah, it controls the card to the top of the deck. But, you know, I'm going to touch on that a bit later. So, yeah, so you're going to have the deck face up in your left hand in a dealer's grip like so. And then uh, you're going to grip uh, grip the deck in a biddle grip. So you're going to have the deck in a dealer's grip and a biddle grip at the same time. So here I'm approaching it in a uh, in a battle grip with my right hand. So here you can real. Uh, so here, um, if you don't know what a battle grip is, again, I'll just go over it. So here, your middle finger, ring finger, and pinky finger are contacting the front short edge of the deck, like so. Your thumb is contacting the back short edge of the deck, and your index is just curled on the bottom, like so. Uh, well, on top, I guess. And uh, here you're going to do a slight grip change from your normal uh, dealer's grip to a modified dealer's grip where you're basically just propped up against uh, the deck like so. So your pinky ring and middle finger are against the right long edge of the deck like so. Your thumb is on the uh, left long edge of the deck and your index is again curled. So again, both of your indexes are just sort of curled on top of the deck. Next, you're going to do. Uh, next, you're going to basically move or slide your thumb, your left thumb, up to the right, uh, to the upper left corner of the deck, like so. And uh, also, you're you're basically just tilting the entire deck uh, lengthwise, like so, so that's perpendicular with the ground, like so. So, here you're going to do basically uh, a very primitive form of peaking. So. You're basically going to uh, apply pressure with your thumb and you're also going to apply a bit of counter pressure with your index, which then causes the deck to riffle. And when you spot the card that you want, you're going to stop riffling. So for example, if I'm looking for the ace of spades and I'm riffling through the deck, I mean, I, I just passed it, but yeah, because uh, I'm looking at it through like my camera, so that's a bit harder. But if I'm riffling through the deck, and also it should be a bit faster. So if I'm riffling through the deck and I spot my ace over here, so this is basically what I'm doing. I, I spot the card that I want, and you can notice that I have this very, uh, this little V formation over here. I'm exaggerating, uh, I'm exaggerating it, but in reality, it should be more or less this. So again, I'm just doing this just for demonstration purposes. So you should have this sort of deal. And uh, 
the very next thing that you're going to do is that now you notice that the top packet is in your right hand and whatever that is uh, in your left hand, well, including the card that you want to uh, pass, is in your left hand, right? So now that you have this V formation, what you're going to do is that you're going to invert this uh, V formation. And it, this is rather simple, is that you're just going to rock this uh, rock both hands the opposite direction. So here your right hand is just going to rock it sort of upwards. And here uh, your left hand is just going to tilt the uh, tilt your wrist downwards, right? So this is what happens. It basically just opens up the break the opposite direction. So again, that's just for uh, demonstration purposes only. Uh, in reality, it should be more or less like this. Uh, so for example, if I spot my ace of spades like over here, right? I just do this, right? It's that, uh, it's that simple, but uh, yeah. So once you have this uh, reversed V formation like here, uh, like so, next you're going to insert your middle ring and pinky finger into the break, right? Your left middle fingers, uh, left middle ring and pinky finger into the break. So here you have it like so, and now your thumb is actually gripping uh, both of the packets, right? So now you're actually, uh, right, so just to go back, you're, after you're done riffling like so, you're transferring and then you're gripping the entire pack, uh, the entire deck with your right hand like so, right? And then, uh, yeah, so now you have your middle ring and pinky finger into the break like so, your your index is still curled on the on top of the deck like so, and your thumb is still covering uh, basically this edge, right? I want to say that your thumb is covering the exposed, uh, exposed break because if you realize it uh, even if you try your best to close the deck there is still going to be this line over here that exposes the break which is not ideal so as much as I want to close the break um, it's still going to be there right it's still going to be visible on the other side so you know your thumbs just there for safety reasons but yeah so now you have your your fingers jutted into the break the next thing that you can do is that now through pure friction with the pad of your fingers, you can now just drag it out of the deck like so. So here you just you're just uh, lower you're just basically lowering lower lowering there you go your fingers like so, and now the card is basically clipped by your index on this side, and on the other side on the face side your middle ring and pinky finger like so. And now that you have this, you just basically continue dragging and you can actually use your wrist a bit. So here you can actually continue rotating your wrist a bit like so until it is clear from the rest of the deck like so, right? And now that you have this, you can actually close the break, right? You can actually close the break and it, that's simple. You just sort of like push it. <laughs> you just sort of use your index to sort of push the the right packet against the left packet, so then this sort of closes. So now you're over here, and the deck is now closed from the break. Here you're actually just going to continue moving until it is past the, the front edge of the deck, the top of the deck, like so. And now you can just replace over here. You can basically unextend, or like re... is it? Yeah, you can re-extend your, your fingers just to slide it on top of the deck like so as you square everything up so that is the basically the one card pass uh from Erdnays. nothing too difficult but again it is extremely uh yeah it's a product of it product of its era so you know that that is whatever but yeah so i'll go over all the motions once more so here, uh, sorry, I'll just cut the ace back to the top, uh, back to the center of the deck. So here I have it in a dealer's and battle grip, like so. I'm just, you know, riffling through the cards, you know, just fidgeting with the cards, but secretly I'm actually looking for my ace of spades, like so. I basically open up a break. Here I close the break, like so. I basically reverse the, uh, the break by separating uh, both packets. Right, so now reverse the break, and now I re-grip the entire deck with my right hand in a build grip. 
I insert my middle ring and pinky finger into the break while my index still remains curled. Here, I can now drag the card out through pure friction, clipping it with my index, like so. Here, uh, once the card is clear from the deck, my index, uh, my right index finger can now push against the right packet, which closes the break. And now I can continue to uh, basically cur curl in my index until it is uh, basically uh, parallel with the rest of the deck. And now I can just basically replace it on top of the deck like so. So that is the one card pass. Nothing too difficult, but you know, it's a... Uh, it's a move that uh, I think it's uh, interesting enough that you can learn. So, yeah. But, uh, yeah. So, now that we've gone over this particular uh, uh, handling of the move, I do want to say that there is a way for you to control the deck, uh, control the card to the bottom of the deck. So, uh, interestingly enough, it's actually not described in the book. So uh, it is the same method as the original, but you do need a few grip changes. All right, so I'll just cut the ace back to the center, like so. So here I'm going to look for my ace again. Um, again, through fidgeting, I passed it again. So, you know, I have it here. You know, I steal the move. Now, the thing that's going to be different is that rather than curling it onto the top of the deck, I'm actually moving uh, I'm actually uh, rotating my wrist counterclockwise so now the card can start rotating to the underneath of the deck right but if you're having difficulties with this uh, particular handling or this particular move is that there might be a problem up to the top of the uh, of the corners of the deck like so so uh the reason why you want to move this uh move your fingers to these corners is because that creates the most amount of space between the palm of your hand and your thumb uh and the deck i mean so if you realize uh if i'm moving if i do it from over here that's not a lot of space right i mean chances are uh my other fingers could get in the way but if I actually move it to the to the top over here, look at how much space this gives me, right? Versus like this, right? I mean, technically it looks the same, but again, it, it, this gives me more space. But another thing is that uh, if you're not careful and you're just still pushing against the deck like so, there might be a chance where this card actually uh, sort of kicks against your index like so, right? And that is not ideal. Deal. So what you can do is that right after you're done pushing against the deck to close the break, you can actually curl in your index like so just to give space for the card to slide in. And now your index can come back and uh, yeah, just reapply pressure on the rest of the deck. So that is the one card pass against the uh, uh, to the bottom of the deck so same handling with just a slight few minor tweaks and uh, and tips on uh, how to do it now the reason why i think that ernest didn't necessarily describe um how to control a single card to the bottom is i think that there wasn't really much use for uh, for controlling a single card to the bottom so for most bottom deals, I would imagine that you would need to do it for multiple cards. Whereas when you control a card to the top, I would imagine that um, you can either do some riffle stacking or you could do some, for example, a second deal for a single card. So when you really control one card to the bottom, there's not really much use for it. And besides that, uh, if you do a multiple card handling of the one card pass, uh, I know it's not really a one card pass anymore, but if you do a multiple card handling, especially the Ernest variation, that automatically, well, that anyways, that puts the cards on the bottom. So, you know, there wasn't really much use for a bottom control for this particular handling. And so that's why I think that Ernest didn't really didn't really describe the uh, the bottom control using uh, this particular method. But yeah, so uh, let's move on from uh, Ernest. Uh, well, let's move on from this particular uh, method. All 
All right, sorry, I just need to drink water. But yeah, let's get into um, the multiple uh, card control, uh, the multiple single card pass that was described in the Earth Naze. Uh, yeah, so unlike the single card control, as I mentioned before in the bottom control, uh, these cards are controlled to the bottom. So uh, if you're looking for like a top control, well, you don't really have it. So the reason why uh, he actually does it to the bottom, uh, I mean, he actually does it uh, to the bottom and he actually does this type of handling is because if you actually notice there, if you do it the, the original method uh, of the single card pass and you do it with multiple cards, because you're actually clipping the cards with a nail uh, with your nail there's not enough friction for you to grab onto all of the cards and move them to the top uh, yeah there's not enough friction in general for you to basically steal all the cards at the same time you can only steal the uh the basically the top card and the bottom card of uh of the four cards or how many however many cards that you want to steal so there's not enough friction for that and so it doesn't work the same as the standard method and that's why Erdnase needed to change the method for the multiple card handling so generally it's the exact same handling as the original uh method but there are a few uh changes so uh i'll just uh Sorry, I'll just give it a shuffle, <laughs> right? All the aces are still there. Uh, sorry. So let me just give it a shuffle. All right, let's see how well that does it. All right, so the original method for the multiple card handling of the um, of the uh, Ernay's uh, one card pass is that as you're riffling, uh, it's that now you're, it's the same grip, but there is a slight difference. Is that rather than having your your left thumb be on the top corner of the deck like so, you can actually, uh, well, you're supposed to actually move it to the center of the deck like so. And now you're actually going to move your your left thumb to the top of the deck right so rather than having the left thumb on the um, on the top corner you're having your right thumb on the top corner so basically it's sort of like you're basically reversing the grip basically uh instead of a standard biddle grip now you're actually having a um um yeah you're actually having that same left hand grip in your right hand so here you can see that now I have my middle ring and pinky finger on the left long edge like so. And uh, I have my thumb on the upper corner over here. And I have my index curled on the face of the deck. And as opposed to the original method, I'm actually just shifting my entire left hand basically to the uh, bottom section over here, right? So here basically my right hand is going to grip the upper portion of the deck and my left hand is going to grip the bottom portion of the deck but you know i'm shifting my thumb so then it's contacting the middle of the deck right now how i can do multiple cards is that here i'm actually riffling uh at the center of the deck so here uh my my uh and i'll get into that a bit later but here I'm actually using my left thumb to riffle and here you'll notice that I had I do have a strong bevel over here just so then it's a bit easier because a riffling at the center of the deck is a bit harder than riffling at the at the corners so I do want to put a bigger bevel so how I can actually put a bigger bevel is that I can actually just you know use my thumb to just kick it at a slant so here I'm just going to roll my fingers to the right and uh, my thumb, I'm just gonna push it. I'm just sort of smearing it. So this bevel will help immensely while I am uh, trying to riffle through the cards. So over here, what I can do is that as I'm looking for the cards, my my uh, right thumb is just sort of resting there, is that as I'm riffling through the cards, looking for the aces or whatever, here I spot one. What I can do is that now, as I riffle past this card, 
So this is uh, sort of like just hanging there due to the pressure. So again, this is like sort of a, now it's sort of a three packet sort of deal. Here, this is going to contact my upper right, uh, my thumb, right? The ball of my thumb over here. And what I can do, oh wait, I sort of missed a step, is that now once I spot this card, I'm actually going to sort of move this packet to the top like so, right? So it's just a bit, right? So once I spot this card, I'm actually just going to shift the upper right packet upwards like so. And I'm going to riffle past this card. So then it sort of just hits my, uh, sorry, that's not supposed to happen. It's just going to hit my thumb like so. And once I have this card sort of uh, against my thumb like so, I'm going to move the entire packet back downwards. And so this creates an in jog like so. And this will allow me to keep, sorry, this will allow me to keep uh, this card um, sort of bookmarked as I'm looking for the other aces. So I'm just sort of going to repeat this uh, looking process and bookmarking process across all of the cards that I want. So in this case, I'm looking for the other aces. So once I spot one, so the ace of diamonds over here, I'm going to move the entire right hand upwards like so. I'm going to riffle past this card once more until it hits my right thumb like so. And then I'm going to move my entire right hand back downwards and close the break. And now I have an in jog like so, right? And I'm going to continue until I get all of the aces, which I might take a while, which is interesting that Ernest would actually, you know, advocate for this method or at least uh, actively do this method. So again, raising up my entire right hand up, uh, upwards. Well, not upwards, it's like forward. Well, in perspective, it's like upwards, but you know. So I'm riffling here. I have my, uh, I have my, uh, I have the card that I want to steal over here. I riffle past it, so then contacts my right thumb and I move everything downwards. And I close the break. And then now I continue trying to find the last ace. Also, that is not supposed to be there. So now I have my last ace, move it upwards, riffle past this ace, move everything downwards. So now I have four in jogs like so. And these four in jogs are my four aces like so, right? Next, what you're going to do is that now that you have all your in jogs, you're going to turn the deck face down like so. But as you turn it, your index is actually going to sort of smear the deck, the top of the deck, uh, sort of to the left, right? Like so. So, uh, sorry, I'm, this is going to be bad. But yeah, so my index is just going to curl in a bit, apply some pressure, and it's going to smear the deck as I place it down to the table. So this smear actually acts as a sort of cover that hides the in jog. So, if I actually remove this cover, you can actually see the in jog cards, which isn't ideal. So again, I want to smear the, the top of the deck. So then it hides all these in jog cards. Now, the very next thing that Ernest actually does is that he goes over to do a series of strip cuts. So if you don't know what a strip cut is, uh, I'll do it with another deck just so then I don't mess up my in jogs. So just so then you know what a strip cut is, is that I'm actually gripping uh, the deck in between of my two, uh, two hands. So I have the deck sort of uh, squared up with my ring fingers. So this is against the deck like so. Next, my middle and thumb are going to uh, basically from each hand are going to grip a portion of the deck. So here, uh, my left hand usually does all the motion. You can do it with the right hand as well. It doesn't really sort of matter, but you know, it's a force of habit, you can say. So here, uh, my left hand is just going to grip a portion on top of the deck like so. And as I move the deck forward with my right hand, I'm actually going to basically cut off a portion of the deck, basically a portion of the deck is going to stay behind because my left hand, uh, my left hand's uh, middle and thumb are going to keep a portion of the top of the deck behind. So here I take a portion and then I table it, right? So here I have a portion of the deck like so gripped by my middle and thumb like so. And as I move this packet 
uh, the bottom packet forward, this packet is just going to be dropped onto the table. And to do strip cuts, I'm basically going to repeat this motion. So once this deck basically circles back, I'm going to take another packet, drop it, and I'm going to repeat this motion until there is none in my hand left. So that is how you do strip cuts. So nothing too fancy. Sorry, my tripod's kind of getting, kind of getting in the way. So you can sort of do them like that, or you can sort of do them from the top like so. Personally, I like doing it, uh, doing them closer at the table, just because yeah, I don't like moving my left hand all that much. So yeah, this is how you do strip cuts. And so now that we've got uh, strip cuts uh, covered. Here, what you can actually do is that now your left hand, instead of gripping a packet at the top of the deck, your left hand is basically going to grip all the end jogs and the smeared cards like so, right? So here, I'm gripping the end jog cards with my middle and thumb, as well as a portion of the smeared cards. I'm going to do a strip cut. So now... When I do a strip cut, I'm basically taking everything except the uh, except the injaw cards. So I'm removing the injaw cards from the rest of the deck, like so, right? So as I move everything forward, like so, all the injaw cards are now at the bottom because of the strip cut. And now basically just continue doing strip cuts as per usual. And that controls all of the cards to the bottom of the deck. So I'm just going to redo that. Uh, I'm not going to do the searching motion again because that's going to take too much time. But yeah, like so. Uh, so you're over here, right? And you have a portion of the deck smeared over like so. Next, you're going to grip everything, uh, a part of the smeared packet over here with the injog like so. Here, you're going to move everything forward like so, uh, while gripping the injaw cards, uh, which I lost one, which is a thing. Yep. Yeah, so you can actually lose your injaw cards, which I don't recommend. Um, <laughs> but yeah. So once you have all your injogs, you can just uh, not get this mirror over here. Man. Okay, there we go. So just... Yeah, just do your strip cuts, and yeah. And I lost a card again. <laughs> Usually it's not like this, I swear. Uh, but yeah. But yeah, so... Really, I mean, it's just a very standard uh, in-jog, um, in-jog, uh, sort of, um, in-jog, riffle shuffle, strip cut, sort of deal of a, uh, of a control the only the basically the only part that's like selling it as a different move is the uh the locating part which is from the original uh from the original uh what was it the original one card pass so nothing honestly that particular so i'm gonna try to do it from this angle so uh, i have all my in jogs over here I contact everything from the front with my index, uh, with my middle, I mean, and I contact everything from the back with my thumb, like so. I move my right hand forward, and if you're having trouble clearing the in jogs with, uh, from your right thumb, like so, you're, you can actually move this packet or the rest of the deck to the right, and here I can move all the in jog cards and the smear packet to the left. So over here, if I'm having trouble, I can just you know, move it past my thumb, like so, right? Table everything, and then I can continue my strip cuts like so. And that places everything to the bottom of the deck like so. And that is how uh, Ertnays originally did his uh, one card pass as a multiple card pass, I guess. I know it's kind of contradictory, but you know, that's, uh, that's that. But uh, yeah, so honestly, yeah, I mean, it's definitely a product of its era. There's no denying that, right? I mean, magicians, I don't think magicians nowadays would look through the deck, 
find it, you know, steal it, and then just replace it, right? That's way too much effort for a magician, especially when you're doing shows, right? I mean, this worked for Ernest because, you know, I mean, gamblers back then, I suppose that, you know, they were just talking, uh, they were trying to not get shot. And so, yeah, so there is a lot of, uh, there was a lot of distractions back then versus magicians now. Magicians now, uh, when you try and present something, you're the center of attention. So you don't have that many opportunities to look through the deck and uh, find the cards that you need. So nowadays, if you really want to... I mean, if you really want to misdirect someone, the easiest way is just to look up and call out their name. But if you do that, then you can't really look down at your hands and try and find the card. So it's not really fit for the modern day magician in this era so that's the main drawback of this move but uh there is a way to circumvent that and that is through a diagonal push through which i taught on the channel a while back but again if you don't know what it is uh i'll just go over it so you have the deck basically in a dealer's grip like so and what you can do is that now you're holding the deck with your thumb and uh, basically uh, the only fingers that really matter are your middle and thumb. And so they're applying pressure like so, right? This is basically all the only the fingers that matter. And you have a card out jogged that you're going to apparently lose into the deck. The very next thing you're going to do is that now you're going to approach the deck right with your left hand and you're going to stretch out your middle finger to contact the upper left corner of the card over here right at the index corner like so and now the very next thing that you're going to do is that you're just going to push the card in but because you're stretched diagonally right against the deck right now when you push this card in, look at what happens right this card when it gets pushed in goes in diagonally and this can give you a lot of uh, opportunities right so if you're doing a single card we can do is that now that you have this you can move the deck up to your bill grip position for a single card you can move it upwards and as you move it upwards your pinky is going to kick the uh the upper right corner into a side jog like so right and now that you have the card side jog, now you can do the, the single card pass as taught originally, and then you can control the card to the top of the deck, like so, right? So that is how we can do a, uh, that is a slight finesse on the single card pass using a, uh, a side jog or a diagonal push through. So again, this is only fit for magicians um, in this era. Honestly, you should just might as well do a straddle pass because it's simpler. So, yeah. <laughs> but if you really want to do a multiple card control, you can uh, obviously do an in jog and it works the exact same way as a uh, as a uh, as basically uh, the same as the single card, but instead of doing a side jog, you're doing an in jog. So, to do the uh, to do the, to do the diagonal push through, you're going to do the exact same thing, but you might want to apply a bit more pressure with your thumb and middle finger because if you don't, uh, chances are the cards might flash on this side. So you want to apply as much pressure as possible with your thumb and middle finger. So now that you have this, what you can do is that you can actually drag your thumb alongside the uh, the long edge of the deck like so. And what this gives you, uh, and what this uh, does to the cards is that because your thumb is fleshy, they're actually constantly contacting this long edge of the, this corner of the cards. And because you're dragging it, what happens is that now they're actually, uh, sorry, they're actually moving downwards like so, right? And now what this gives you the opportunity to do is that now you can use your pinky over here to kick the cards into an in jog. This exaggerated, but that is a thing. So now that you have the cards in an in jog, so over here, uh, sorry, I should have done it the opposite direction, but yeah. So I'm gonna go over it once more, over here. So now that I have all the cards uh, sort of now that I do the di diagonal push through, I can drag my thumb alongside the long edge of the deck, like so, 
kick everything into an injog with my left hand, and as I put the deck face down onto the table, again, I just curl in my index, like so, and I smear everything backwards, like so. Right, so this hides the injogs to some degree. Obviously, you're looking at an over, over the shoulder view, so some things will flash. Now, I can just do the exact same thing as the original Erdnase method, where I just grip everything from the back with my, um, uh, from the back with my thumb and everything from the front with my middle finger. And now I can just do my strip cuts. And now that I'm done doing my strip cuts, everything should be controlled to the bottom. So that's how, that's just a minor finesse for magicians with this one card pass using a diagonal push through. So for a single card, again, you can do a side jog, but for multiple cards, you can do a in jog. You can move the uh, the diagonal the diagonal jog into a in jog. So there are two alternate handlings that I do want to touch on for this particular one card pass. So uh, let me just find my ace of spades real quickly. There it is. So you can actually hide this move under the guise of a turnover. So when I'm doing a, uh, a one card pass over here and I have it stolen, what I can do is that I can actually just turn using my, uh, using my middle and thumb over here, I can actually start turning over this, uh, this deck face up like so. Wait, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. I reversed the card, so that was uh, that was awkward, but yeah. So now I can actually start turning this deck uh, basically face up using my uh, my ring finger as well. So the, my ring finger sort of pushes against the deck uh, and my uh, and my index as well. So here my index sort of extends and my and my ring finger extends as well. So this sort of uh, turns the deck face up, and underneath the guise of turning the deck face up. I'm doing the pass, right? So I have the card over here. So I have it stolen, and now I start doing the one card pass, uh, start doing the turnover, and then I coalesce everything, and that is a one card pass under under the guise of a turnover pass, right? Or a turnover, not a turnover pass, but yeah. So over here, right? And so this idea comes from uh, Harvey Rosenthal, uh, from packet switches part three so this isn't uh this isn't the mechanic that he used but i believe that he was the one who merged a one card pass with a sort of a turnover motion so i do want to credit harvey rosenthal now for a chloe's palm for the next handling a chloe's palm it's basic I touched on the Chloe's palm in the free turn pass tutorial, so you can go look at that. But basically, over here, now that I have the card stolen, I'm still in this perpendicular position. What I can do is that now I can move this card and I can pin it against my uh, pinky finger. So here I can actually clip the uh, the upper right corner of the card with my pinky finger, like so. And now what I can do is that now I can let go of the deck with my right hand back into my left hand in a dealer's grip like so and now i can just remove everything and now it is in the, uh, and now the card is stolen in a pinky clip and now uh once uh, to avoid flashing anything i do want to um i do want to uh, basically grab the upper left corner with my index so now it is in this sort of uh relaxed grip like so and with this, I have enough cover for the card to basically just relax, right? And so this is basically uh, a Chloe S palm again, as I described, uh, that you know lets you, uh, yeah, just palm the card face up while the card uh, while the deck remains face down. So I believe Harry Lorraine uh, does a sort of uh, sort of something similar, but Harry Lorraine does it from a. Uh, he does it to a classic uh, palm, and he does it from a spread. So it is a different mechanic, but he is the one who does a one card pass to a palm. So I do want to credit Harry Lorraine for that. But again, this is a different sort of palm with a different sort of handling. So again, I have the card stolen. Here, I push the I push the the card against my right hand, where I then where I can then clip it with my pinky and ring finger. I remove the deck into my left hand. And here I can just curl in my index so then contacts the upper uh, left corner like so. 
and now it is in a Chloe as Paul. And that's that. That is the uh, those are the two alternate handlings that I came up with. Uh, I came up with uh, for the one card po uh, pass. So one is obviously the turnover by Har Harvey Rosenthal. So again, here, like so. And I can have the Chloe's palm, right? Which is like so, right? So those are the two alternate handlings. But now I would like to go over the uh, some some applications. So obviously you can use it as a control. The other thing they can do is that you can actually do it as a color change. I'm not sure why, but you know that is a thing that you can do. So uh, actually, you know, let me do it like this. So over here, I just do the one card pass, and here I just wave my hand over, and here I can have a color change. The very next thing that I can do is that I can have it as a vanish, as per usual, right? So here I have the card face up over here, and then it disappears, right? Because you know I did a one card pass. So that is another idea that you can do. Hi. So uh, the one who created uh, this particular handling of the one card pass is actually Erdnaze. So you can find it. Uh, God, I don't remember in which page, but he described it as a ordinary methods of stocking, locating, and securing. So again, it's an ordinary stuff. It's uh, it's definitely uh, yeah, it's out of date <laughs> for for these uh for this sort of era of card magic. But you know, for his era, I sort of understood why he did it. So it's an interesting move. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily recommend people learn this, <laughs> but yeah, so it is an Earth Nays move. But yeah, so back to uh, back to the application. So when you could do when you could do things as a vanish, you can obviously do it as a uh, as a uh, what was it as a uh, as a production too, right? So I mean, you could have a card insert it this side. And they could just do it as like a production if you want. I mean, I don't know why you would do it as a production, but there's way better productions out there. But you know, I'm just tossing random things out there. <laughs> but now you can obviously do it as a palm, as I described before. You can do it as a uh, Chloe's palm, like so, right? Nothing too difficult. But you can obviously do it as a reverse as well. So this is a Ken Krenzel idea, which he describes as a mechanical reverse. This is not the same, but it does work the, the same as a mechanical reverse. So here you have the card clipped. And here as you turn the deck uh, over in a face down position. So here you can just use your pinky to just basically curl in the deck. So then it goes face down here. It's basically just going to land on top of the face up card and then you know I can just set the card that uh, set the deck down and then yeah have a card reversed on the bottom so that is how you can use it as a reverse for um, for yeah and you can obviously do it as a sort of weird switch uh, usually I would just do a center change so if you don't know what a center change is uh, it's basically a center deal but done as a sort of switch so here I have a card that I want to switch. So the four of diamonds, I have the five of hearts. So basically it's a top change, but you know, it's uh, done from the center rather than from the top. But if you do want to do this as a center switch sort of deal, so you do need to do, uh, do a risk kill. So if I have a card that I want to switch out over here, right? And I want to, uh, you know, have uh, the card that I want to switch out uh, sort of in a sort of ready to pass sort of thing. So here I have it sort of pushed over. And here as I basically want to sort of stud deal type of thing with the top card. So as I go ahead to sort of stud deal, I'm basically just going to grip this card instead with my ring finger and my thumb. So... Again, uh, I have a card face up on top and I have a card basically passed like so. And as it looks like I'm going to stud deal this card, I'm going to grip this card instead. So here, as I pull the deck away, I'm going to basically recurl in my thumb like so. As I sort of uh, uh, give them this card, right? So the turnover sort of hides the action, but yeah. 
So here I have a card that I'm going to pass over here. As I, as I try to give them this card, I'm going to risk kill and I sort of like do a stud deal type of turnover. So it is a sort of weird switch, but uh, generally I would just recommend do a center change, which again, is just a top change, but done from the center. So if I wanted to change the four of diamonds with the queen of hearts, I just do this, right? So again, just do a center change rather than this weird switch. I think that's a lot better than that. But again, I'm just throwing in applications because why not, right? It's just, it's magic. We're just trying to have fun. And so, yeah. But that's basically the end of uh, this tutorial, this handling. So if you want to learn more about uh, the one card pass or some different handlings on the one card pass, obviously for this move, it comes from Erdnays. Uh, so is my face going to appear there right so basically if you want to learn more about this sort of pass or you want to learn uh the original handling which i might have butchered but you know that that's what it is the expert at the card table by sw Ernays back in 1902 so that's a thing that you know Ernays created uh you can have the straddle pass by jason england he teaches it at uh, theory 11 you can have The Best of Friends, uh, Volume 1, I believe, by Harry Lorraine, who unfortunately passed away a couple of weeks ago. So, uh, yeah, uh, they do sell it as an ebook around, so you can go ahead and buy that. There is Card College, Volume 1, by Roberto Giobi. He teaches a, I believe he calls it a one card middle pass. So, you can go ahead and look at that as well. But besides that, I believe those, uh, those are the resources that are still in print that cover a one card pass so you can go ahead and look at those uh but besides that yeah um it's definitely a, a bad but sort of interesting move and i say bad not because it's like inherently bad move it's a move that sort of it's definitely a product of its era it's a product of when cards were sort of um sort of more for gambling and not for performance so Whereas the card handler would be sort of the background rather than the center of attention. Because now, uh, because before, you know, you could just sort of, you know, play around with the cards, right? And people won't judge you. But now that you're like a magician, you're the center of attention, you can't get away with this sort of move. So it's bad in this context. It's bad when you're doing it as a magician, when you're doing it as a, as the sort of center of attention. But back when you're a gambler i think it's definitely it's definitely an interesting thing that uh yeah that that uh it's definitely an interesting thing to look back on and just you know wonder the history behind but yeah so with the uh yeah so that's uh that's basically it for the one card pass uh again this is gonna stay up on youtube and uh yeah next month i'm going to uh revisit the classic pass because the original one was badly filmed and badly created so i'll just uh touch on that once more but yeah that's about it and so have a good lunchtime uh yeah i'm probably impeding on the lunch on your lunchtime but yeah uh, and so yeah see you guys next time and thanks for dropping by so yeah and so yep